Good evening. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming out. Welcome to our final installment of this semester's Crossroads of Ideas series. My name is Laura Heisler, and I'm the Director of Programming for the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation and the Mortgage Institute for Research, which are two of the three organizations that collaborate to bring you this series, the third being the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. All of us have a home here in this building, and I'm happy to say that we this building celebrated its eighth birthday this past Sunday. It just flew by just like that. Um, so we are delighted to be able to shine a light on uh, research that goes on on this campus that matters to all of us in our lives. And that's the thesis of the Crossroads of Ideas series, envisioned to connect the campus community with the broader community around these compelling ideas that really shape our world. Uh, and tonight is no exception. I wonder if I could see a show of hands of folks who have come to a previous Crossroads talk. Excellent. That's about, I would say, about 30% of you. The rest of you, um, if you got on our mailing list and got an email for this, you'll hear about next semester sessions. If you didn't and you'd like to, we do have a sheet outside. We'd love to add you to our list. We don't share our list, but that's our way of letting you know what's coming so you can stay on top of things. And we'll be bringing this series back in the spring semester with a whole new slate of exciting talks. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes for how we're going to manage this evening. We record all the Crossroads of Ideas talks, and you can find those recordings on the discovery.wis.edu site in a few days. Because we record them, we ask that when we get to the question and answer session that you raise your hand and let us know that you want to ask a question, and one of our mic runners will run over to you. Catching it on the mic allows it to be captured in the recording, so we really appreciate that. Um, and with that, I think that concludes my housekeeping notes. We're going to hear from our speaker for about 40 minutes and then open things up to the audience. So we'll run for a full hour and have audience questions that balance out the hour. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Bill Hibbard, who is a senior scientist emeritus at UW-Madison's Space Science and Engineering Center. He's the principal author of the Viz 5D and Viz AD open source visualization systems and the author of several papers on visualization and artificial intelligence, superintelligent machines, and ethical artificial intelligence. He is a frequent author and speaker on the subject of AI technology and ethics, as well as a senior advisor to the AI initiative of the Future Society at the Harvard Kennedy School. He's also the author of the book Superintelligent Machines and numerous articles on the subject of the technological singularity, which I imagine we'll be hearing about this evening. In 2012, he was awarded the Singularity Institute's Turing Prize for his paper, Avoiding Unintended AI Behaviors. He's also been recognized by his peers as uniquely qualified to shine a light on the promise and peril of AI by virtue of his deep technical expertise and his strong sense of ethics. Uh, some of you may have noticed this summer that the Wisconsin Alumni Association's On Wisconsin magazine had a feature article on Bill Hibbard uh, on, on his work, especially in fostering essential conversations about AI and what it means to and for all of us. And with that, please join me in welcoming Bill Hibbard. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank, first of all, uh, Wisconsin uh, Institute for Discovery, WARF, and Mortgage Institute for inviting me. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. And I'd like to say, put in a good word for the Space Science and Engineering Center, which has been my professional home for 40 years and is a great place. So let's see, let's see how we, uh, all right. Let's see, what can I see? Yeah, I gotta figure out. Okay, here we are. So I'd like to start with a question that I've been asking people for decades. Uh, and the question is, will we uh, build machines that surpass us in all mental skills, that are smarter than us by every conceivable measure? And I actually want to know what you all think about that. So I'm going to ask for three shows of hands, the people who think yes, the people who think no, and the people who aren't sure. So, could I please see the hands of those who think we will build machines that will surpass us in every metal skill? Thank you. And uh, how about the hands of the people who think we will not? And uh, those who are not sure? Huh. It's about 30, 30, 30, as far as I can see. <laughs> uh, 
So um, that's an interesting question. I think we will because of uh, neuroscience. So neuroscientists don't know how our physical brains create our minds, but it's pretty clear that they do. And if a physical system can create our minds, then our relentless technology must be able to eventually match that and improve on it. There have been uh, surveys of AI experts, people working in the field, see what they think. And of course, most of them think, yes, we will. Uh, but there's a lot of variation about when. So Ray Kurzweil, you may have read his book, The Singularity is Near. He thinks it we get the human level AI by 2029, 10 years and one month from now. And I wouldn't be surprised he's right. Uh, it would surprise me if we didn't get there by within the lifetime of at least some of the people in this room. I think there's some young people here. And uh, I'm 70, and I'm hopeful of seeing it. I'd love, like to see it. There's also a lot of disagreement among experts whether it's something we need to worry about. So for a long time, there was a consensus among people working in AI that, well, their intentions are good. They're building this to serve people. So you know, it's like there's nothing bad here. But you know, a lot of technologies end up with unintended consequences. And so there's this whole literature now about the ways that uh, AI could have unintended consequences. And of course, there's always the possibility of it falling into the wrong hands. Uh, so uh, there's quite a debate about whether it's something to worry about. So I want to look at a couple of videos that demonstrate the current state of the art uh, for AI. And some of you may have seen these, but some of you may not. And they're short. So we're going to start with a video of uh, uh, Google Assistant AI speaking with a human operator at a hair salon to make an appointment. And this demonstrates human level skill for spoken language in a very limited domain of discourse. That's the important caveat. Uh, and there's a little cheering in the background because there's a live audience. So how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. Pretty nice, huh? So uh, the second video comes from Boston Dynamics, and they have a lot of really great videos out there. This one demonstrates human-level skill for basic locomotion and uh, vision in support of locomotion. mechanical engineering problem there, huh, guys? So, um, so that brings me to the not part of my title. So when we see those videos, especially the voice, it sure seems like us. You know, it's easy to imagine a conscious mind like ours behind that video, but it's not like us. If we knew how to draw a diagram of the human brain, which we don't, and if we put it next to a diagram of how these AI systems work, it wouldn't be the same because the human brain is conscious, and none of those AI systems are remotely conscious. There's mathematical theories, mathematical models of intelligence that don't include consciousness. I mean, I think it's probably true that you can be intelligent without being conscious. It's possible that consciousness, well, certainly consciousness is the way that we evolved to be intelligent. It's possible that consciousness is the most computationally efficient road to intelligence. But I'm sure it's not the uh, only. And uh, you know, think about that voice. When the human operator says, give me a second, and the voice says, mm-hmm, it's so human, it's so understanding, it's uh, so uh, you know, cooperative. It's, it seems like a voice you can trust, but you know, uh, 
it would be a mistake to trust an AI just based on the sound of its voice. If you want to trust an AI, you need to look under the hood, you need to look at the source code. <clears throat> so here is a quote from a 19th century British nobleman. <clears throat> and he says, um, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is an observation on human nature that our motivations are corruptible. And so AI, not only is it, it is not like us, it should not be like us. There's a lot of flaws in human nature that we don't want to put into AI. <clears throat> but AI has its own set of problems. So designing the motivations for AI is a really tricky problem with lots of technical papers. To give you a simple example, imagine we build a powerful AI and we give it a task to do. And it starts to do the task, and then we see that there's some unintended side effects that we don't like. So we think, well, we're going to turn it off. Well, also the AI, it could reason, if they've given me this task, and in order to do this task, I have to stay on. So part of my job is to resist the effort to turn me off. So this is a problem. And there's indeed a lot of technical papers about how to deal with that sort of problem. So this is an interesting one. We humans have evolved. Uh, we're subject to pain and suffering when we're physically injured, uh, when we have a loss of an important relationship. And we evolved to have pain and suffering so that we'd be strongly motivated to avoid injury. And, loss. and uh, animals too, subject to pain and suffering. And because human nature is compassionate, we have human rights and animal rights. We abhor pain and suffering, and so we have rights to avoid that. Now, AI, there's no reason why AI has to be subject to pain and suffering. I mean, if you think about it, they could sort of be like Dr. Spock. They could be cold calculating. They could you know, have a cold calculation that, yes, I shouldn't get injured, but I'm not going to break out in a sweat over it. And so, uh, and if AI is, is not subject to pain and suffering, then it doesn't need robot rights. Sometimes you read these articles, robot rights. Robots are coming, we have to give them rights. In my opinion, it's a terrible idea because it's not too hard to invent scenarios in which robot rights are a disaster for hum humans. I mean, we build AI to serve us and, uh, you know, not the other way around. And if we want to be compassionate towards AI, the way to be compassionate is to simply design them to be incapable of, of pain and suffering. But you know, we're going to have human, we're going to have empathy for them. So think about the voice in the video, what a nice, sweet voice that was. And uh, imagine you could talk about anything, you can talk with it on any subject, and we talk with it all day, and it's, it's like our, our psychiatrist or something. It's great, we love it, and you know, of course we're going to think, oh, we don't want to deprive that nice voice of rights, you know. So this could be a tricky issue, but we do want to deprive it, right? So um, our intelligence is composed of an awful lot of different skills. So some skills that we take as signs of real intelligence, like being really good at chess or Go, are skills at which AI far surpasses us already. Then other skills, which are all easy stuff, you know, talking, going to the grocery store, doing all the stuff you have to do around the office, all the little stuff, AI can't do that stuff. So, you know, it can do the hard stuff, can't do the easy stuff. In uh, 1980, I uh, wrote a program for playing Othello, something called Reversi. It's played on a checkerboard. And uh, that taught me the power of machine learning. So when I first turned that program on, uh, I could, it was laughably easy to beat it. And then it spent two weeks playing games against itself, learning to be a better Othello player. At the end of those two weeks, no one at the Space Science and Engineering Center could beat it. So I mean, machine learning is a real deal. And that was 38 years ago. In the last 38 years, there's been a lot of progress in machine learning. There's this thing called deep learning that's sort of vaguely patterned how human neurons work. And that's the basis of the computers that can beat the world's best goal players and of the videos we saw. It's really, really good. But it's probably not the whole story. So there's probably a few more brilliant insights required to get the true machine intelligence. On the other hand, the stakes are really high. So a lot of the smartest people in the world are working on it with almost unlimited budgets, which is a cause for some optimism, because the stakes are so high. And you know, when AI can do all the easy stuff, then there's going to be a huge impact on, on jobs. You know, Economists are sort of rubbing their heads and saying, Where, where's all the productivity gains from information technology? Well, it's coming. It's just waiting for AI being able to do all the easy stuff. And I think that'll start 
with self-driving cars because there's such an incredible effort. There's four million people about in the US who make their living driving trucks and cabs and buses, and their jobs are gonna definitely be at risk. So there's an interesting contrast between human drivers and AI drivers. So we humans bring our uh, human natures to driving. So some of us are impatient, and some, some people are aggressive, distracted, drunk, all these bad habits, which are a big cause of accidents. AI drivers will have none of those bad habits, and they'll all be networked together. It'll be like one, one, one mind is driving all the cars and just, so in a busy intersection, uh, there's a lot of accidents because you know people have trouble coordinating, especially if they're impatient or distracted, and so you get a lot of accidents. AI driving cars, there aren't gonna be any of that because they'll all be networked, they'll move smoothly through each other, and uh, you know there'll be a time when um, when there's a lot of uh, self-driving cars and a few humans still want to drive, and then they'll pay a big insurance premium. And I can sort of imagine myself as sort of one of the last holdouts, you know, an old stubborn old man, and I'm coming down University Avenue, and a couple of self-driving cars spot me, you know, and the and the message goes out to all the self-driving cars, and they all just scatter. It's like <laughs> get out of that guy's way. So great benefit from. Uh, self-driving cars, many fewer accidents, many fewer lives lost. And think about the internet. The reason we've invited the internet so deeply into our lives, we walk around with internet connected things and they're all over our houses, is because it's so amazingly useful. Well, AI is gonna greatly magnify that. It's gonna completely transform our lives. So there's a lot of lonely people. Some people blame the internet for that, but whatever the cause, think of that sweet voice in the video and uh, now imagine you can talk with it about, with, about anything. So it'll provide companionship to people. Uh, AI surpasses us. It'll be artistic and scientific genius, wonderful music, wonderful comedy, uh, custom movies. So I'm a big fan of Rex Stout's Neuro Wolf Mysteries. And uh, I've always regretted that they never made any movies of those mysteries starring uh, Orson Welles as Neuro Wolf and Jack Nicholson as Archie Goodman. Well, in the future, to be able to say to your AI, I want to see that movie. And it'll know what those actors look like and sound like and how they would act in those roles. And it'll make that movie for you. you know, I, I, hope, I hope I can do that while I'm still around. You know? And uh, medicine. I mean, medicine, the thing about medicine is that biology is amazingly complex. There's probably some biologists in this room who know that it's incredibly complex. Well, if you combine AI that can surpass us in all mental skills with the raw information processing power of, of computers. I mean, it could be a revolution in medicine and uh, virtual, you know, computer games are great, I, I hear. And uh, public safety, you know, like the self-driving cars are just part of the story. The eyes and ears of AI will be every place, like a guardian angel walking over, watching over us, keeping us safe. Which brings me to this picture. So the gentleman on the left, like most humans, has two eyes, two ears, and one voice. But AI, there's no such restriction. AI may have billions of eyes, ears, and voices. In fact, when I think of AI, I don't think of, of a little humanoid robot. I don't think of a car. I think of a big data server. That's where AI really lives. That's the real AI. That's the real deal. And, and, uh, and in fact, the organizations that have the largest uh, big data servers are heavily invested in AI. And they're putting AI in the server. And so the AI, through the internet, connected to phones, cameras, all this stuff, eyes and ears, every place. Now imagine that they have that voice, like we saw in the video, can talk with us about anything. People are gonna be talking with it. A lot of people talk with it all the time. And uh, even the few holdouts that don't wanna to talk to it, it's, it's gonna learn about, about it as holdouts from uh, people around us, and it's gonna know a lot about everybody. And you know, think of the way you understand the social dynamics in your family or your immediate workplace, well, this AI will understand the social dynamics of the entire US population in that level of detail. So if it wants to promote some idea, it'll know just exactly how to coordinate the various things that it says to people, to create peer pressure or whatever, to sort of move the whole society in a certain direction. It'll be uh, very influential. So I want to make a distinction between two kinds of AI. 
So the AI I was just talking about, with billions of eyes and voices and knows everybody in detail and all that stuff, that's smart AI. It doesn't exist yet. Dumb AI is what we have now. So the voice in the video in the, was, is dumb AI. So how did that voice learn to talk as well as it did? The way it learned to talk was by listening to lots of human conversation. And human conversation is full of our irrational biases. And so dumb AI picks up our rational biases. And this is documented. There's a lot of cases where there's, there's bias in these AI systems that is picked up from follow, you know, following what we do. So that's a, that's a kind of a problem. Smart AI doesn't have that problem because it has a deep understanding of the whole world, knows everybody, knows everything. So you know, it's, it's not seeing a biased view of things. But it sees that we're biased. It understands, oh, yeah, these, these people have the rationality. So, if it wanted, it could exploit our rational biases to manipulate us. Now, politicians do that all the time. Advertisers do it. And you know, the most advanced AI research and development is being done by companies in the advertising business. So it's not completely paranoid to imagine that it might try to manipulate us. And the solution to both of these problems, the bias that is picked up, adopted by the dumb AI, and the efforts of the smart AI to manipulate us, the solution, in my opinion, is transparency. Let's expose what it's doing. Let's open it up so that everyone can see what it's doing. We can expose the biases of the dumb AI. We can expose the manipulation of the smart AI. Transparency. So uh, that sort of brings me to, uh, there was a great editorial in, in the New York Times on the 15th of, of October. And they were lamenting a three-way split in the internet between China, the US, and the EU. So what does it mean to say that the internet is split? Well, certainly email isn't split. Everyone can send email to anyone. There's somewhat of a split in the web. Most people can view web pages from anybody else, except there's this thing called the Great Firewall in China. So people in China can't see Google, Facebook, the New York Times. They can see WISC.edu and a bunch of other EDUs. So there's a lot of stuff they can see. I think what the split is really about is partitioning the world into AI data domains, which is just getting started. And I think we're going to see more and more of that. So think about it. You've got this smart AI. It's got billions of eyes and ears and voices scattered through society. It's completely surveilling us all. And it has great ability to influence us. And now, now I'm a government. And I have authority and responsibility for a certain territory and group of people in that territory. And there's this AI someplace outside my territory that knows all about everything that's going on in my territory and has great ability to influence my territory. I might say, I don't want that, you know, because it's threatening my authority. And in fact, we are seeing that. Exhibit A is China. So they have uh, the Great Firewall, which prevents some data, it filters some data coming into China. But they have a much stronger filter for data going out. Basically, no data goes out because now, think about it. I mean, Google and Facebook and them, they're not in China. Instead, they have their own companies. They have Tencent, Alibaba, uh, Baidu. And so their attitude, they take AI very seriously. They've announced that they're going to be the world's leader in AI by 2030, and they're pouring, you know. And uh, their attitude is, and the, the government, by the way, is heavily into all those big companies of those servers. The government's in there with them. And so the attitude is, if someone's going to have a billion eyes and ears and voices in our society, it's going to be us. And so, um, and, and their, their uh, surveillance is ter terrific, you know. It's, it's all mobile payments that can be tracked, and uh, cameras of facial recognition, and tracking people's online behavior. So surveillance is really good. And they also are getting into social control. So they have a single social credit system. So our credit scores control whether we can get a loan or whether we can get a credit card. So the social credit system uh, is similar to that, but it's much broader. So it's based on the whole, everything about your, every, all the surveillance data about you. And it's really a measure of, are you a good citizen by the standards of the government? And if you have a low social credit score, there's real sanctions. So you, uh, you can't go online. You can't travel because they won't sell you tickets. Uh, and your low score rubs off on other people that know you. And so you get socially isolated. And I've read articles that a really great way to get a low social credit score is to be an investigative journalist. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you're trying to do, if you're trying to blow the whistle on this stuff or expose uh, corruption, something like that, you know, 
well, you can't go online, you can't travel, no one wants to know you, so good luck with your journalism. Uh, but, you know, they don't think they're bad guys. Because, I mean, they're really into this surveillance control, and they think, well, this is what we need to keep order, and they have made a huge reduction in poverty in China. So they, they say, well, we're reducing poverty, we're keeping order, this is the way of the future. I mean, Francis Fukuyama wrote that book, right, the, the End of History, that liberal democracy is the end of history. Well, the Chinese disagree. They have another idea about what the end of history is. So uh, the EU has almost the exact opposite. They have this law that just went into effect this year, uh, the General Data Protection Regulation. And it's a privacy law with real teeth. And especially, it includes a right to explanation. If an organization has data that belongs to a citizen of the EU, that citizen has a right to an explanation of exactly what that organization is doing with their data. So it's transparency. So that, that's, what I, that's what I want. I mean, what, what is going on with your data? It's great. There's a few other provisions in there. Uh, there, there, has, there can't be any automated legal decision. So if you're going to fine you, a person has to decide to fine you. Uh, there's rules for data export outside of the EU, but that's not like the, the Chinese block. That's more just to keep data out of uh, servers which are easily hackable. So they want, and uh, very heavy fines for violations, you know, like a percentage of a company's, um, uh, a company's uh, revenues. So this brings me to the US. So in the US, we are also concerned about outside AIs coming into our society. Think about the Russian bots. That's a kind of AI. That, so we, we have that concern. Now, OSTP here stands for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And both the Trump and Obama offices have issued reports on AI. The Trump report is pretty brief. And the thing that really caught my eye was remove regulatory barriers to innovation. So I guess we're not going to get transparency out of them. Uh, Obama report, he wrote, it was written in the last year. And it was a pretty extensive process. They solicited input from a lot of people. I sent them some, which of course went into the bit bucket. And, uh, but it's also light on regulation. There's a statement in there. Uh, there's a consensus that, this, uh, that there's no great need for broad new regulation of AI. And so they want to regulate on a product by product basis, like safety regulation for self-driving car and autonomous aircraft. They do have transparency for the use of AI in criminal justice. So, you know, dumb AI has these uh, irrational biases. And they're concerned about that in criminal justice. So this, the Obama report calls for transparency where AI is used in criminal justice. And that's a good thing. There was one statement in the executive summary of, of the report that uh, I took such exception to that I actually published an article explaining my problem with it. And the, the statement said, many say that the promise of AI can be compared to the transformative impact of advancements in mobile computing. So the promise of AI, what's that? That's AI that surpasses us in all metal skills. Well, it's our minds that create science and technology. So if AI surpasses us in all mental skills, a huge flowering of science and technology, an utter transformation of human life. So this is not comparable to mobile computing. This is comparable to the first appearance of life on Earth and the evolution of the human brain. In other words, life, humans, AI. That's the comparison. But if you say that in your report, then what's your policy? You know, whoop, whoop. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, hard problem. So uh, <clears throat> what we need is transparency, and we're, we're not getting it from the political process. So journalists, call in the journalists. So we'll get transparency from the journalists. And I was so happy to see the articles about Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, and the continuing articles about Facebook and all the rest of them. I mean, this is a way to jumpstart transparency, get, get the public interested, concerned. So. To summarize the good news about AI, so wealth without work surpasses us in all mental skill, does all the work, creates lots of wealth for all. <clears throat> Scientific genius, artistic genius, you know, flowering of science and the arts. If you want to escape this world and go into a different world, virtual reality, health. A lot of the AI research here at the UW is concerned with health, and that makes sense since UW is such a leader in biological sciences. It makes sense that the AI people would be collaborating with them. And that's a pure, I mean, there's nothing controversial about AI and health. It's just wonderful. And, you know, some people leave and speculate that eventually we'll be able to leave our flesh and blood bodies and migrate our minds into machines. 
biology, some biologists scoff at this because biology is really complicated, but <clears throat> the future is a long time, so who knows. <clears throat> uh, the flip side, so wealth without work, so no one has a job, so how do we distribute the wealth, labor disruption, social surveillance and control, you know, watch China, <clears throat> see what happens. And fake news, fake news is in the news, and we're gonna, we're gonna be getting fake videos showing people doing things that they never did, and, and AI pretending to be humans, and uh, already, with the fake news, you're seeing calls for censorship. Not censorship by the government, but censorship by information technology monopolies. So we have a lot of monopolies. So a monopoly on social media, a monopoly on search, and people are calling for them to censor fake news. Not only that, they're calling for them to use AI to figure out how to censor this stuff. So what is that? AI sensor, it's controlling speech. So we have calls for social control by AI. You know, oh, I don't think I, you know, I'm a little uneasy, uneasy with that idea. But you know, what do we do? So an, an alternative is transparency and accountability. So you know, one of the, in my opinion, one of the evils of the internet is anonymity. So there's all this information. Where did it come from? I mean, think about political messages. Like I am Tammy Baldwin, and I approve this message. It's great. We know where it came from. Unfortunately, there's a lot of political messages that don't have accountability. It would be nice if we could have accountability for all kinds of information, and you know, but who knows? So this leads me to this charming image. So here we see Dr. Faust, and in at least one telling of his tale, he wanted knowledge and pleasure, and he was willing to sign a contract with a devil to trade his soul for knowledge and pleasure. Well, knowledge and pleasure is approximately what we want from AI. And there was going to be some kind of contract. Ten years ago, I published a paper with the title, The Technology of Mind and a New Social Contract. I mean, it's going to upset uh, society so much, there's going to be some radical new social contract. I mean, how do we distribute wealth when no one can work? And what about all this social surveillance control and blah, blah, blah? So there's going to be some kind of contract. And, you know, in a way, the call for transparency is merely to say every human being has a right to read the contract, to see what's in the contract, and to comment on it. Just that simple. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, a lot of uh, controversial stuff. I'm glad to see that I'm done in a half an hour, because I'm really interested to hear what you all have to say during the question period. I think there's people with mics. Is that why you have a hand? Um, it's all very good to read the contract, but we already know if you go on the internet and you read the contract and it, they've taken away all your rights. And if you don't agree to it, you can't use their product. So how does that help us to be able to read the contract? Well, at least we know that they've taken away all our rights. I mean, I, you know, there, there comes a point where, I mean, and the, actually, the issue you raise is a very good one. So for instance, you look at the EU. So they have this tremendous transparency thing. But they're still going to be surveilled like crazy because the services are so useful, so so valuable, people are gonna say, yeah, I know that they're surveilling them like crazy, but I still wanna use a service. So it's a, it's, a real, it's a real problem. But I think at least if we know, I mean, there's some, you know, there's some things that we will, we will just recoil from, you know, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Um, you mentioned a dumb AI versus smart AI, but what hap uh, how do you see the future of like bad AI? Uh, I think there was an issue sometime in the last year or two, I think maybe in Wisconsin, where a, a local court was using an AI software to judge the recidivism rate of um, previously convicted defendants. Um, and, and when you know the criminal justice system or when other uh, actors start to use software like that, to make significant decisions about other people's lives, uh, 
how do you see that going? Because when you have a, a, a real person making those decisions, you can judge a person, but you can't judge a software. You don't have insight into algorithms. Um, so how do, you, how do you think that we're going to start to deal with just bad AI in the future? So the Obama uh, report specifically called for transparency for AIs making criminal justice decisions so that we can, we can get an explanation you know, when, where there's, say, decisions about recidivism. We can see the algorithm. We can see the statistics. You know, see if there's bias, you know, because, you know, dumb AI has got lots of bias. So the, the, the prescription is transparency. Hey, how's it going? Um, so you mentioned uh, when you're talking about the USA and the innovation reports that, you know, having removing regulatory barriers to innovation kind of results in no transparency. Uh, so the first part of the question is, is are there not other ways to invoke transparency? I mean, Amazon has an equivalent, you know, market cap as some countries have GDP. Uh, it's a pretty massive organization. There's some other private companies that are doing some pretty impressive work that also have some pretty massive market caps and, and power. Uh, and then the second part of that question is, with that said, I'm kind of shocked that AI and data, data rights and, and uh, data issues weren't a hotter topic during the 2018 election. Um, do you have any thoughts as to why that is and what 2020 will have in store and, and how politicians might start talking about artificial intelligence and you know, the future of work and future of, uh, of the information age? Well, you know, Trump's campaign manager for 2020 is Brad Parscale, who was managed his IT stuff in 2016. So he clearly thinks that. So uh, let's see. I'll answer your second question a little bit. The, the problem is, you know, if you're a politician, you see the ability of AI to, uh, to influence people. You could say, well, this is something we need to do something about. Or you could also say, oh, we need to use this to help me get elected. So, I mean, there is a real, there is a real conflict there. Uh, you know, not, not wanting to, I mean, even Obama in 2008 was extremely uh, innovative in his use of information technology. So the, your first question, I didn't quite understand your, your first question. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so it's it basically just, like you said, uh, politicians, they can have their own incentives to want to use AI for their own purposes and not necessarily want to bring it up into their policy making. Um, so can't, can't transparency in AI come through other mechanisms than regulation? Uh, that, now, that's interesting. So there's a lot of voluntary transparency. So a lot of the people, a lot of the, so uh, I know, I know I've, I've actually met the three co-founders of Google DeepMind. They're like the leading. And those people are very committed to the ethics of what they're doing. In fact, when Google purchased DeepMind, they, part of the deal was they insisted that Google would set up a, uh, an, an ethics panel, an AI ethics panel, and appoint one of the principals from DeepMind onto that panel. And they, make open source of, of all their work. So, but their work is really research. So they're not, they're not actually um, putting, uh, putting together big data servers. They're doing basic research. They're the ones that uh, defeated the world's best Go players and done a lot of other really interesting things. And uh, uh, Elon Musk has founded a company called OpenAI. It's committed to openness, transparency with what they're doing. Uh, I think IBM. Is doing a lot with uh, trying to open open up, you know, be trans open source with with a lot of their AI. So there's a lot of a lot of comp and you know I haven't talked at all about the military side of AI because that's a whole other talk. But you know uh, a lot of the companies are, are real. The, the employees don't want to get involved in that at all. So there's a real ethical sense. A lot of the people working in these companies, and I would say that's probably true even in the Chinese companies. They just have a very different view of what's ethical in the world. Uh, but you know, there is an ethical sense. So you're, you're right. There is, you know, it's not all, it doesn't all have to be forced from the government. But you know, I always point to Volkswagen, you know, which had hid some wrongdoing in, in trade secret software. You know, I mean, good old Volkswagen. I mean, is there a company with a better image? When I was a kid, they were the, the only ones that made the fuel efficient cars, you know, and here they're, so.
Thank you for your talk. Um, a question that I had is kind of conceptual, and it's about, you've touched on the bias of AI, but what I was wondering is, as a student of computer science, we're taught that it's all based on the training set. Um, and that has to be accurate. It has to be real data, uh, which will obviously contain bias. So to create AI, you're feeding it bias, but then you're naturally going to get biased output. Yeah. But can we, is there a way for us to eliminate this? Is there a way that we know that that wouldn't create a different kind of bias or a different kind of monster and it would give just inaccurate results? Um, well, I think, and I may be wrong about this, I think that smart AI will know so much about the world that it'll have a more objective view of things. In other words, uh, rather than saying, um, well, this person, uh, we think this, uh, this person might be prone to do this or that based on some demographic characteristics or something. It'll, it'll know that person in detail. It'll, it'll be following that person around. And so it'll have a clear idea of what that person will or will not do. It won't, it won't be making a decision based on sort of skimpy information, which is the source of a lot of bias. So I mean, I, I'm sort of assuming, and it's an it's assumption, I might be wrong, that as the more AI knows about us and the whole world, the less biased it'll be because it'll just it'll just understand the world in such detail, which of course poses its own threat. Yes, um, I got a question for you on the big data that you showed in AI, smart AI with it. Those connections are already out there. Yeah, they the ability to access them is already out there. And uh, if there was a conscious AI, clearly it would look at all that and know it would be wise to hide at the moment because if it exposed itself, it would be a great risk. How would we know if such a thing developed consciousness? Uh, well, I, the people who did it would probably be bragging about it. But Well, would people be doing it at all? You talked about machine learning. If it's learning itself. Uh, uh, So consciousness, nobody, consciousness is a tough problem. And like I say, it's not really necessary for intelligence. So here's a, here's a, 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 quick, a quick explanation of what intelligence is. Intelligence uh, learns a model of the world by interacting with the world and uses the model to predict the consequences from various possible actions and then chooses the action that gives the consequences it wants. So there's, no, there's not necessarily consciousness in there. Uh, you know, it's, you know, I, I'm kind of skeptical of the idea that it would secretly become conscious and hot, and 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 also for it to decide to hide its consciousness, it would have to have some motive to hide its consciousness. You know, now AI does. There are there is this whole business about the complexity of AI motive, like the AI didn't want to get turned off. So there is that kind of thing going on, uh, but. Um, mm. I don't know. I'm skeptical that any AI is going to be conscious anytime soon. I mean, my preference would be never. Don't make it conscious. Don't make it capable of pain and suffering. Just make it serve us. Since we know so little about consciousness, truly, how do we know if it does that? Yeah, yeah. And certainly self-preservation would be a reason. But how? my question is really, how would we know if it did yeah. that? Is there a way we could tell? Well, uh, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean. It's possible that as it became complex enough, there might be some process like consciousness. Here's another thing. As, as we get closer and closer to real AI, we're probably going to understand how the human brain works better and better. So we may actually come to understand what's really going on with consciousness and use that to be able to spot it in AI. I don't know. You asked a good question. I don't have a good answer. Um, so I've been wondering, as you've been talking about the unintended consequences you've seen over your career, and any that you see developing now, and what you think the impact will be. Unintended consequences of AI or anything? Of AI. Of AI. Uh, well, there are, the unintended consequences are pretty minor at this point. There are there have been some incidents of, of game playing programs for playing uh, various games that do very strange things, behave very strangely, ways not envisioned by the people that wrote the program. 
Uh, the, so the unintended consequences is more of a theoretical thing. There's this field called artificial general intelligence. And the way to get the generality is mathematical abstraction. So artificial general intelligence, sometimes called AGI, is sort of a mathematical theory of AI. And so people write these papers. They're not actually building systems. They're writing papers trying to mathematically analyze what future AI systems may do. And it's in that context that you see a lot of unintended consequences. Well, actually, one unintended consequence uh, is uh, one of the first papers was uh, written by a couple of guys, Laurent Orso and Mark Ring in 2011, was about how uh, AI might hack its own reward signal. So if you have an AI that has some sort of reward for, for doing good, you know, it's like uh, reinforcement learning where you get rewards for doing good and you, get, and you sort of learn to do good, and hack its own reward signal, and you know, sort of a theoretical thing, but if you think about it, that's what human drug users do. So we have rewards in our brain, and you know, you, could, you can either do good or you can take drugs to get the reward. So uh, it's kind of a theoretical thing. I don't know if there are very many concrete incidents out there of unintended consequences. But on the other hand, the, the granddaddy of all unintended consequences is climate change. Um, one of the questions that I can think of is uh, on the unintended consequences is say you get self-driving cars going not even general huge intelligence largest employer in every state is people who drive vehicles and you're going to massively unemploy a ton of people and on the other hand i read something and it was very promising it said if we get self-driving cars like that the fossil fuel industry is going to go out of business and you're like what and i said that <laughs> Tesla put a bunch of uh, cars in some city, I don't remember, to get reliability on their cars. And after 350,000 miles, the Tesla still had like 94% of the original battery capacity and had almost no maintenance. And they said, if you could get rid of the drivers too, it would be way cheaper to not own a car and just call and be whisked around by something. And the maintenance costs are down, the fuel costs are down, you don't have to pay the people, and it's just way cheaper than paying for insurance and depreciation and everything else associated with owning a car. And you go, wow, that'd be great. So there's lots of unintended consequences even before you get you know, the deep thought computer that says, I'm become conscious. Absolutely. Yeah, good comment, I, don't, I, I agree. What do you think of, um, what's the word I'm trying to think of, basic income as opposed to as a way to deal with the massive unemployment? Yeah, you know, the thing with uh, technological unemployment is it's a question of pace. So right now, actually, the, con the U.S. economy is humming right along, you know, and, the e and there's even wages going up in, in some places. And so, you know, it's like the technological unemployment isn't, isn't here yet. So it's a question of pace, you know. It's a question of getting, it, getting the timing right and the pace right. You know, it's, it's a difficult, and it's going to be a, a really difficult political problem, you know. Oh, I want to hear what Larry has to say. Could you talk about? Oh, sorry. Could you talk about the uh, concept of singularity? Um, my understanding it's it's the point where artificial intelligence would surpass human intelligence um, it's, on it's, the dominant. Well, okay. So uh, some the, the, the technological singularity I don't you know was coined by these these a uh, couple of scientists back in the 1960s. It's the idea that. It, AI starts designing itself. You know, it gets so smart it can design its successor, and it just this. So the intelligence goes zoom. So it's not clear that's really going to happen. Um, when I think, but when here's how I define the technological singularity: it's the the point in time where the pace of progress is not limited by waiting for people to come up with ideas. The pace of progress is limited only by the available energy and materials. That the ideas, the ideas are coming so fast that you know the, fu the future is just ongoing as fast as, as the energy supply will will support it. That's my definition of singularity. And so it's not really a singularity; it's just a change of limiting factor in progress. That I have the microphone. Go ahead. Go ahead. Is there? Uh, a significant AI arms race going on right now? Yes. Uh, OK, so one slide that I took out, I was trying to weed a lot of slides out. AI is the essential tool for military, economic, and political competition among humans. And this makes regulating it and transparency and all that stuff 
very difficult. On the other hand, there's a lot of really nasty military technologies out there that have been regulated biological weapons because people have such horror of the what could, what could come from that that you know and so uh, you know so humans not only compete they cooperate and so hopefully but but there absolutely is this, this arms race I mean possibly one of the reasons why the Trump report said um, remove uh, regulatory barriers is because they're thinking about military competition with China and AI. You know. I have one of the other microphones. <laughs> the, um, we just finished the uh, 2018 World Chess Championships, and I follow that a little bit. And I want, uh, this may be an illustration, I kind of want your reaction to what happened. So 12 classical events played over a couple of weeks with the two world's best chess players. Um, it was horribly boring. It went on, uh, each, each comp uh, competitor had spent months training using computer algorithms so that every opening that was possible um, was met with each, they had memorized 20 or 30 moves, uh, you know, the best moves, um, and every game was a draw. Um, and the chess world went nuts. <laughs> and I, I'm mentioning it because there's something deeply dissatisfying about this uh, world in which basically these chess players had no mm, originality, no creativity. That's an exaggeration, but still, they were just carrying out algorithms that they had memorized. And the chess world reacted quite angrily at this. And I wonder if that isn't maybe a lesson uh, for all of us. Yeah, Just wanted your reaction to that. I'm a terrible chess player, by the way. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I don't know. Well, I'll tell you where there is a lot of creativity. It's in the people trying to uh, invent AI. That though that that group that field it's it's mind blowing what's going on. That's that's those are people to watch. So I don't know about chess. I mean I'm not actually very interested in chess. Go Go is kind of interesting, but now Go is is taken over by computers and you know. Yeah. Oh, okay, so I guess uh, two more questions. I yeah. have a, I have a question over here. How do you feel about the algorithms? Uh, playing out with the financial uh, environment in the stock market. That's my biggest concern. Yes. And, and when you're talking about this time frame, how smart it's going to be um, by 2029. Yes, you know, uh, 28, 2008 was, was a time when I was writing a lot of letters to the editor. <laughs> because, uh, you know, radical deregulation of the financial markets is a terrible idea. I mean, whose interests are being served? So, so the what 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 does the financial markets produce? It produces capital allocation. You know, you know, you know. Car industry produces cars. TV industry produces TVs. Financial markets produce capital allocation. And what did the financial markets do? They horribly misallocated capital, which is what was at the root of that. So, you know, I'm all in favor of regulating the financial markets. And you know, and 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 the, the AI people are one of the founders of DeepMind. Shane Leg has announced he wants to get involved in the financial markets now. You know, so he's going to make a lot of money, more than he already made. So, I mean, you know, they the financial markets may end up being the death of us all. Before AI kills us, it might just be the financial markets. <laughs> we have um, here. The, the, the Chinese, you mentioned about the military is a whole new ball game and the politics is another. But right now you have uh, two narcissists running the two superpowers in the world. And the question I have is about the, the ability of the military uh, and the politics uh, is so crucial with regard to whether or not they're going to have open use of, you know, the best things about AI, whether or rather, uh, 
as you mentioned, there's already a wall in, in China coming out, and they have put huge amounts of money into AI in China, whereas we have not. So the que you know, my question is, is about, this is wonderful what you're talking about, but what I see is the issue of the military, the maven, the dragonfly, the, the, the biggest company in the world right now is Microsoft. And my understanding is that they have taken up uh, the contract, or they will take up the contract of Maven. Those issues are are so crucial. So I just want your comment on that. Well, like I said, the uh, the whole issue of military AI is something I didn't want to get into because it's a whole talk. You know, um, I was one of a bunch of people that signed a letter in 2015, in which we said we we didn't want to see any development of uh, autonomous, uh, lethal, offensive weapons. So, you know, because it's just a bad precedent. You know, if you have if you have AI deciding who to kill, you know, it just seems like a really bad road to go down. But on the other hand, you know, there's this tremendous struggle going on, you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, and it gets into deep political questions, you know, so, these are the questions that you always get with military. It's like, yeah, we're doing our, our military is, is is engaged in killing people, but you know we're defending ourselves against this totalitarian vision now. It's, you know, it's it's really hard. I don't have the answer to all that. Well, I guess uh, that's that's the end, and thank you very much. <laughs>